Rabbi Annie, are you ready to start? Um, sure, Chak Sameach, everyone. We, I can just give another, and we said we'll, we'll start at 10.05 if folks wanted a little, a little stretch. So I can start. Yeah, it looks like a lot of people are back. So okay. if you want to go ahead, um, I, will, I, I will let you introduce yourself. <laughs> sure, thank you. Um, Chag Sameach, everyone. What an honor to, to be here and a gift to be able to find this way to study Torah together in this unique year. Um, thank you to Rabbi Stone and to Dr. Albert, to Anne for your incredible um, teachings this evening. Looking forward to learning with Rabbi Abe as well. I'm Rabbi Annie Lewis, uh, Associate Rabbi at BZBI. Um, I want to enter into our learning together tonight with a little bit of song to, to frame um, what it is that we're going to study together. And so the, the name of this session is called Faces, Masks, and Divine Light. And want to share a melody, a song that comes from the liturgy of Kabbalat Shabbat was written by Elazar Azikri um, from the poem Yedid Nefesh. And the words are Higale na ufros chaviv alayat sukat shalomecha. So it's uh, please, my beloved, reveal yourself, spread the shelter of your peace over me. Higale, gale, gale. Na ufros ufros chavivialai et sukat sukat shalom. Beloved, reveal yourself, spread the shelter of your peace over me. I'm moved in these verses by the yearning for God's presence, a yearning to behold God's presence, and at the same time, a yearning for protection, for a shelter of peace to be spread over us. And as I've been thinking about the stories that we have of Revelation at Mount Sinai, I've been wondering about this question, can you have both at once God's presence and protection, right? Many of our accounts of what happened at Mount Sinai when God revealed the Torah to Moshe to the people was that it was a soul-shattering and disorienting experience um, full of voices that one could see uh, the senses were disrupted and merged. Something was happening that had never happened before. Um, and there was something beautiful and something powerful and also something dangerous in the revelation that happened. Um, and yet we, we yearn for God's presence and we also call on God 
for protection and, and for peace. Um, so I'm kind of holding that tension between the two, and we're going to look together about how that plays out in um, some of the accounts of what happened on Mount Sinai, what happened in the relationship between God and, and Moshe. So we're going to look at some text from Kitisa, and the, the last time I was studying this, we held uh, a lunch and learn in person. It was the last time I gathered together um, for an in-person program with a group from the shul. We were at a law firm. We came together to, to study Torah, to study this Parsha. And it um, speaks also to this interesting experience of Moshe after beholding God's presence wearing a mask over his face. So this was the, the beginning of social distancing restrictions taking hold here in, in Philadelphia. Um, and now, you know, so many of us have been, been wearing masks, have been um, seeking different kinds of protection. So I, I was curious about, um, about these texts and wanted to, to share them um, with you tonight. And I've also been thinking about the power of our faces. On the one hand, we are here up close seeing each other's faces. On the other hand, we know that um, what happens on Zoom, we're, we're missing certain things. The, the human face is so complex and our, our brains are wired to pick up on all kinds of um, cues through our faces. And with the pixelation of Zoom, we don't get that. We don't get that full uh, ability to, to communicate and to read each other's faces in the way that we do um, when we're up close. And yet there is this other strange intimacy about Zoom, right? Um, as, as Anne talked about earlier, right? We're, we're looking into each other's homes. We're seeing each other in a different environment um, than, than we're used to. Um, so I felt so much during this time, both uh, a yearning to be together in person and also a gratitude for this type of presence of being able to still be together across um, distance. So these will be some, some themes that we explore um, in our study today. Um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen so that we can look together at uh, some of the of the texts. Um, so first, I just want to name that, that we learn uh, something about Moshe that happens between Moshe and God that happens for, for no one else. Right? We're told that Moshe is the, the prophet of prophets. Um, we're told that Moshe um, and God had a face-to-face -face relationship in the, the book of Exodus. Um, chapter 33, verse 11, we're told that that God would speak to Moshe, panim el panim, ka'asher yidaber ish el re'ehu. God would speak to Moses face to face as one person speaks to another. And no one else is described in our tradition of having this close a relationship with God. Um, and yet, we are also told later on in some texts that we're going to look at that, that um, Seeing God's face is dangerous, that no one can actually behold God's face and see God's face and, and survive it. Um, so what's happening there? What's happening with that, that tension um, between God revealing God's self to Moshe more than to anyone else, and also uh, God trying to, to protect Moshe? And then what does Moshe do with that divine light? And, and how does Moshe both transmit that to the people and also protect himself and protect the people in that encounter of passing the Torah uh, forward. All right, so here comes some texts for us. Um, okay. Um, and, um, so, um, in Parshat Kitisa, right, the, Moshe receives the, the Luchot, receives the tablets twice. The first time around, Moshe is coming down the mountain with these tablets and sees that 
the people in their anxiety in his absence and being distant from him and not seeing him and not seeing Moshe's face for, for 40 days, the people get, get nervous. Um, and they decide they want to make a God that they can see, right? They, they make the golden calf. Moshe comes down the mountain, is filled with anger, with frustration, shatters the luchot, um, goes up for round two, and in that time intercedes with God on behalf of the people, pleading with God not to wipe out the entire people on account of, of what they've done with the golden calf. And God gives uh, Moshe the tablets a second time, and perhaps this time we're told Moshe, you know, inscribes them um, himself. There's a different partnership that happens in this second time around. Um, and so this is where we are in our text, Exodus chapter 34. Moshe is coming down um, from, from Mount Sinai, right? So, so the Torah tells us Mos Moses came down from Mount Sinai. And as Moshe came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moshe did not know that the skin of his face was radiant since he had spoken with God. Um, so I just want to point out, this is again the second time around. This didn't happen the first time when Moshe came down the mountain, but um, now he's, he's coming down and he, uh, the Hebrew says, right, ki karan or panav, um, which is, is strange language. And we're gonna get a little bit at how the commentators interpret that. Um, there's the, the skin of his face is, is uh, radiant. Um, and we're told, so he comes down, then Aaron and all of B'nai Israel saw that uh, Moshe's, the skin on his face was radiant, or Karan or Panav, and they were scared to come near him. Um, so they sensed that, that, that there's something different about Moshe, and they are, are worried. Um, but Moshe called to them, and Aaron and all the the chieftains in the assembly returned to him, and Moshe spoke to them at that point. So he kind of reconciled with them, he called them forward, um, and then we're told afterward all of B'nai Israel came near Moshe, and he commanded them in all that God had spoken to him on Har Sinai and Mount Sinai. And when Moshe had finished speaking with them, he put a masveh, which can be translated as a mask or a veil, um, over his face. And we'll continue on. So whenever Moshe came before God to speak with God, he would take off this mask um, until he came out, and then he'd be out, you know, and about in the community. Um, and when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, um, the Israelites would would see how radiant the skin of Moshe's face was. And then Moshe would put back the mask over his face until he went to speak with God. Um, so I want to pause for a moment here um, and ask, um, I'm just going to look for your faces here on the screen and see if anyone uh, would like to share, why do you think Moshe wears this masveh, wears this mask? What's going on here um, in the text? What do you think is the purpose of him putting a, uh, a mask over his iridescent uh, radioactive face? <laughs> um, I'm not sure I can see all of you on the screen, so you're, you're welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like to uh, share response. Because people are scared and he wants to have them feel better by not, they're freaking out when they look Sorry. at him and he knows, we, he knows that and he is trying to help them. The room, so. Oh, sorry. My room, <laughs> Leah's on another. <laughs> Yeah, lots of others. Torah coming down. Beautiful. <laughs> lots of voices in Torah. So yeah, he, but... he is, um, thank you for that. Um, so Moshe, in a way, he is um, 
he's aware that the people are afraid of him, that there is some kind of new distance between him and the people after this experience that he's had, and he is um, wearing the mask to uh, help, you know, earn, earn his trust with them or make them not be as afraid of him. Well, God had, there's the Midrash, I don't know if it's Midrash or not, but mm -hmm. it says that God commands Moses to take Aharon and the 70 elders up onto Mount Sinai, and there they see God. Now, it, because we know that God came down in some physical manifestation, it doesn't say what, but how come their faces didn't light up, and how come like, the people weren't scared of them? Great question, Jacob. Thank you. Yeah, why um, did only Moshe have the glow on his face? What about the others who were there with him, who perhaps right, didn't get quite as close to God, but um, did they have some of the light? Um, and there are commentators uh, who, who pick up right on this chain of transmission, um, if we scroll back uh, for a second, right, because of Moshe calling to Aaron, calling to the elders, calling to the whole community. And they say that the light kind of went uh, from his face to their face because the, the strange thing, he would take off his mask when he was receiving Torah from God, um, and then he would come out masked, but he also would take it off once he kind of got the people's trust, perhaps, to give over the Torah. So there are commentators who say that that light went from Moshe's face, you know, um, to Aharon's face, to the face of the elders, to the face of the whole community, that that light of Torah um, did kind of refract and reflect and um, transmit to others as well. But yes, great, great question. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the idea that comes, I think, from psychoanalysis that describes um, like people wearing masks as a metaphor for how we act in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and thinking about Moshe and his quality of, of anav, of humility, um, where Moshe both is, is very aware of the existential difference between him and everybody else and doesn't want to emphasize that <laughs> distinction between himself and everybody else. And, um, you know, in the ways that my, my father of blessed memory would talk about, um, you know, uh, powerful men who end up in scandal because they start to believe about themselves the things that other people say about them. Um, and, and I see some of that in Moshe, the, the resistance, or, or almost, I guess, maybe I'm reading this, this mask mm -hmm. as Moshe wanting to protect himself from becoming too invested in being that guy who gets to be alone with God. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, there's a way of keeping himself in check and of, mm -hmm. you know, I almost imagine them like what's like, the, the, the psychological mask that he's wearing is presenting mm. to everybody that says, I recognize that I'm a human being like the rest of you. But mm. you experience me as somehow completely different than you, but I don't want to experience myself as different. Hmm. Beautiful. Um, that was his way, some sign of his humility and of a, a statement that he was um, still part of the people, um, that he didn't want to experience himself as, as separate, um, and that tension internally that he felt. Thank you. Thank you so much for these um, uh, comments. Um, I see, oh, Sherry? Jeff. I mean, I guess, except there's also like a false humility. There, false humility is also a possibility though too, right? So there's also the things we do that Right, that create other layers, um, and I mean, although like we see Moshe negotiating that, like his difficulty right later on as a leader in delegating, right, and he needs like Yitro to help him delegate and almost like reintegrate himself in with the people because he becomes so used to being a part as a leader. Because I mean, the fact is, it is a different experience to be alone with God, so. I mean, so he's 
I mean, the fact that he is wrestling with that is, mm. it's not unreasonable, right? To, to, ha to have to figure out how you have this experience that changes you and, um, and, and you could also see a mask as in some ways trying to keep the light for yourself, right? Is mm -hmm. it, right? Is it on the one hand radiance when it goes further from you, it, it does dissipate, mm -hmm. right? So it kind of goes both ways. Yes, beautiful. And, and some commentators also talk about that when he was doing mundane things in the world, he would Dafka keep on the, the mask um, to keep that light there so that he wouldn't lose it um, and get uh, caught up in, in worldly things. Um, thank you so much for, for all of these comments. I want to um, move us uh, to some other, uh, well, to, to the um, what Rashi is talking about. So, so to sort of understand, we talked a little bit about the mask, but what about this uh, Karen, this Karan, or this um, light coming from his face? So some of you I may mean, know the word Karen in Hebrew can, can mean horn. And for those of you who are familiar with the, the Michelangelo um, sculpture of Moses, right, he is depicted with a physical horn on his head and there is this anti-Semitic trope for a long time, right, that, that Jews have horns, which um, can be tied to this uh, text as well and, and um, a false interpretation of this or one as a physical horn uh, on him. So I think it's an interesting uh, point, point to share. So I want to look at what Rashi, um, how he explains this beaming, this glow on uh, Moshe, right? So, so Rashi says, or Karen is an expression connected with the word karnaim, uh, horns, um, and the phrase uh, karan or the light horned is used here because light radiates from a point and projects like a horn. Um, so it's interesting to think about the, the motion of the light as Rashi's understanding it. There was a little point, Moshe was this focal point, and then out from him the light uh, radiated. Um, and from whence was Moshe privileged to have these rays of glory, Rashi asks. And he says, our rabbi said that they originated at the time when he was in the cave. For the Holy One of Blessing then put his hand upon Moshe's face, um, as it said, I will shelter you with my hand. So Rashi is um, citing the Midrash in Midrash Tanhuma, um, saying, asking this question, why Moshe? Why was he, why did he merit to have these rays of glory, um, these beams of light from his face? And according to the Midrash, this came from his time in the cave. So what cave are we, are we talking about? Okay, so um, if we go a little bit earlier um, in, in the Parsha, in Parsha of Kitisa, we are at this point where Moshe, um, as we mentioned earlier, right, he shattered the first set of tablets. The people have made this golden calf. God is threatening to wipe out the entire people um, Moshe pleads for God's mercy, pleads for God's forgiveness, pleads for another chance. Um, and in this conversation, Moshe also pleads to behold God's presence. Um, he says, oh, let me behold your presence, right? Hareini na et kvodecha. Um, and God answers Moshe, I will make all my goodness pass before you, um, and I will uh, proclaim before you the name, my name, right? And um, the grace that I grant and the compassion that I show. And God says, but you cannot see my face for man may not see me and, and live. And so God says to Moshe, but I'm going to do something else for you. He says, Hine makom iti. here is a place with me, um, a place near me. Station yourself on this rock, and as my presence passes by you, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will shield you with my hand until I have passed by. Um, 
I'm just always so moved by this phrase, hine makom itzi, right? Here is this, this place with me. You can't behold me in my entirety. You can't see my face and live. That's not possible. And yet, I'm going to give you this place near me, and I'm going to give you a safe station here at the rock, and I'm going to shield you with my hand, God says, until I've passed by. Um, God says, then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back, um, but my face must not be seen. And so in the, the Midrash, um, you know, cites this incident um, at the rock in Midrash Tanhuma, and um, again asks this question, uh, why did Moshe merit these, these beams of glory? And our sages of blessed memory said, because of the incident at the rock, um, as it is said, and it shall come to pass while my glory passes by, um, the Holy One placed his hand on him, and because of that, Moshe merited the beams of glory. Um, and so then the Midrash is citing a verse from, from the prophet Habakkuk um, describing God's presence, um, which I'm just going to scroll down. Here we go. Um, the prophet Habakkuk said, God is coming from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. God's majesty covers the skies. God's splendor fills the earth. And what is this splendor? Um, it is a brilliant light which gives off rays on every side, and therein God's glory is enveloped. So in this verse in Habakkuk, it has the, this language of uh, karnaim, of these rays of light. Um, God's presence is described as rays of light. Um, and there's also this idea that somehow the glory is like enveloped or hidden. Um, and so, in the Midrash, um, the, the rabbis are, uh, they sort of translated that there are these rays, uh, God's glory comes in the form of these rays, um, and also in a hiding of the, the power of God. Um, but I think this is also so curious to me because, um, right, why did Moshe merit this? Like this question of why Moshe deserved this, why not others? Um, and so I was wondering if it, if it was because he asked, because he said, Harani, not Kodefa, like out of that place of yearning, um, this thing happened where God did, uh, Moshe couldn't see God's face, but God protected Moshe with his hand um, in this moment somehow, gave him a place um, near, near God transmitted to him this light. Um, and so I just wanted to, to posit this possibility of what was Moshe's merit. And we talk about Moshe being so humble, um, the most humble person on earth, and the Rebbe brought up that, uh, Moshe's humility. Um, and yet Moshe got closer to God than anyone, um, than any uh, prophet. Um, and so perhaps there's, there's something in that, in that yearning. Um, wanted to uh, lift that up um, and want to pose, pose the question to folks here. Um, what do you think, uh, why, why did Moshe merit uh, to have these rays of light? Um, what do you think about this explanation of, uh, of the rays of light of God, as God's um, God's light, God's presence. Rabbi Annie. It's yeah. Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hey. I'm looking for you. No, I'm going to answer your question with a question, I think. Yes. All this talk about Panay and Panay makes me think of the blessings we give our children on Friday night and the Birkat Kohanim where we're praying that God turns God's face to them, be gracious to them. Yes. And, and sometimes it's translated as countenance or spirit, but mm -hmm. you know, translate as face. And so this seems to be like a bit of a hope that we hope that our children 
get some of this essence that you're describing here that Moshe has, but at the same time, Moshe is afraid of the people seeing that light coming from his face to them. And so I, I'm, I, I'm still trying to rationalize how to fit in this blessings for our children that we want God's face to shine upon them, yet we're afraid of that light at the same time. And if I can just add on to that, yes. like whenever we put the Torah away, Hashivenu Alecha Venashuva, turn your face to us. Um, yes, so beautiful. So thank you. Both both of you are, um, yes, that, that Torah, we're, we're going to uh, get to it. We're going to talk a bit about that, Birkat Koanim, the blessing, the priestly blessing, the blessing for children, and, and that has, how it has those words for for God shining God's face and Jacob, what you raised about um, tshuva, about reconciliation. So um, yes, thank you both. Uh, I hope in just a few minutes, I'm gonna tie in some of this Torah you just shared to, to what we've done so far. Um, okay, so that was the other part of the Midrash, but we're not gonna do that together today. Okay, so um, I was, uh, thinking about, again, what, what went on on Har Sinai? And again, why did Moshe merit those rays of light um, the second time around and not the first time around uh, of receiving the tablets? And I think that uh, perhaps it had something to do with the, the wrestling and the reconciliation and the, the yearning and the struggle that went on between Moshe and God and the people and some kind of process of tshuva that went on the second time around when, when Moshe went back up to get the tablets again. Um, and so I was thinking about where are other times when we talk about God's face in the text, in the Torah, um, and one of my favorite um, moments in the Torah comes in, in the book of Genesis in Parashat Vayishlach, where we have the story of reconciliation between Jacob and Esav, um, these twins who have been estranged for a long time. We have the entire narrative of Yaakov, of Jacob's life, of him sort of running away from who he is and hiding and ducking and being afraid. He is terrified that his brother is coming to kill him. He splits up his family and his camp and, um, and he ends up alone on the banks of a river and he wrestles with some kind of, of being that we're not really sure what it is. Maybe it's his own conscience, maybe it's God or an angel, uh, but he has this intense struggle, this intense wrestling. And after this, he sees his brother um, and in the process of their coming together of being face to face, we have this gorgeous line in the Torah um, where Yaakov says to his brother, um, take from me this gift. And he says to his brother, um, seeing your face is like seeing the face of God. Uh, and you have received me with favor. Um, you've desired me. I, I thought you were going to kill me. We would never have this relationship again. And, and you have taken me back, right? We've had this moment of repair, of reconciliation, of return. And seeing your face, my brother, is like seeing the face of God. Um, and then I thought it was interesting. It just hit me in, in rereading this narrative that um, Esav leaves, he goes to Seir, and Yaakov, we're told, goes to Sukkot, um, which could be a physical location, but also just this image, again, of, the, of um, Sukkah as protection, um, as a Sukkah of, of shalom, of wholeness, um, of thinking of, again, that language in Parshat Ki Tisa, the connection um, with this language of God, sort of creating a sukkah with God's hand over the spelling a little bit different, but I think there's still a connection between, right, the, the words of um, God sheltering Moshe with God's hand. Um, 
so this made me think about perhaps seeing the face of God. Um, and again, he says it's, you know, here, oh, it's like seeing the face of God. We can't actually see the face of God. But what do we imagine it would be like to see the face of God? Perhaps it has to do with a moment of unexpected transformation and grace and reconciliation and tshuva. And I think that we may be able to read this into our narrative of Moshe going back up on the mountain, receiving the Luchot after this struggle, this wrestling um, with with God um, and of that exhale, that um, miracle of, of God accepting Moshe's pleas uh, for mercy, for loving kindness, of God offering a possibility of, of reconciliation and favor. Um, and Jeff, you had mentioned the priestly blessing. So um, we get that in our Parsha, which will, you know, we're in Parsha Naso, so after Shavuot, we'll be reading this in the Torah. And again, this priestly blessing has the language of, um, you know, the, the God transmitting a blessing to Moses and saying, give this to Aaron and Aaron's children. Um, and through them, through all of you, you will be able to give this blessing, right? Like the light, you'll be able to transmit the light, the Torah, the blessing from you um, to your brother, to your family, all the way out to the people of Israel. And what is the blessing? It's a blessing for God's protection, right? May God bless you and protect you. May God, um, right? Yeah, er Adonai Panav Elacha Vichuneka. May God shine God's face upon you and be gracious to you. And our commentators understand that to me. May God deal kindly with you and favorably with you. A God who we see can sometimes deal with um, anger and with a different kind of fire. But this prayer is a prayer for protection and a prayer for God's grace. And God's grace is expressed as a shining of God's face on, on, um, on one. And again, Yisa Adonai Panave Lecha Ve'asem Lecha Shalom. May God lift God's face toward you and give you peace. So again, this language of, of God's face, um, when we are looking for blessings of um, protection, blessings of shalom, of shlemut, of wholeness, of peace, of loving kindness. Um, and I was also thinking about the, the custom, the way that um, in some communities and in Israel, those who are koanim, who are priests, continue to bestow this blessing on people um, and on festivals. And the hand motion, right, of um, some people say this is like creating a, a shin uh, for God's name, for Shaddai. But I was also thinking about it in the context of the story of God hiding Moshe in the cleft of, of the rock. Um, and something about, um, you know, as Rashi and the Midrash were describing that um, Moshe received the, the light at that moment when God placed God's hand over Moshe uh, to protect Moshe. And also thinking about how the Kohanim, when giving this blessing, there's a custom too, right, to go under talit and to sort of hide and not look at faces. Um, so just uh, intrigued by, by those parallels. Um, and I, um, um, so I'm not sure that I quite answered, um, Jeff, your, your question about um, if God's face, right, there is also this, this danger um, to God's presence, and yet we, we pray for God's presence, but I think we pray for a very particular um, kind of God's presence, which the, the light of God's face, not the direct and dangerous presence of God, but the way God um, can 
transmit God's presence with us through um, loving kindness and through compassion and um, in, in a way that's safe and loving and protective. Um, so I want to pause here um, and see if there are any reactions to, to what I've shared um, and sort of positing this idea that um, God's face, God's light, um, as we might understand it in the Torah, um, might represent the, the possibility of tshuva and reconciliation, a willingness to receive one another in love and to change for one another. That seeing God's face is not a given, that it's something that um, takes yearning, takes work, or work can come, that God's light, that God's presence can come through that uh, yearning, through that struggle and wrestling through those moments of um, unexpected reconciliation. Um, so I want to pause here and see if there are any um, reactions that you have to this idea, any questions that have come up in this um, stream of texts that we've, we've looked at together. I mean, just going back to Eicha, like one, which is where the Hashivenu line originates from. I mean, this is the story of our darkest hour. This is the story of the destruction of the temple. And I'm wondering, why is it that in that moment where God seems to have abandoned us, abandoned us, where we've lost faith in him, where he's lost faith in us maybe, why are we asking him to come back? Hmm. That's a good question, right? In this darkest moment, do, why do we, do we even want that reconciliation after the, the pain and, and the trauma? Um, why, right? This yearning, this longing um, for that reunification um, is so, so deep, right? Any other books have uh, questions or reactions? I I just I think thinking back at just like where this study started about like Moshe hiding his face with a mask in some mm -hmm. way to mm -hmm. like protect the people from something mm -hmm. about him that might radiate out and be dangerous to them in mm -hmm. some way, whether that's like, not necessarily that they're gonna be harmed by like the light of God or whatever that's radiating from him, but even just like from their own perception just feels poignant and relevant mm -hmm. in terms of our current living reality mm -hmm. of wearing masks to protect other people from something about ourselves. Hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, that we can um, relate that if there is in that idea of Moshe, um, Moshe's wearing of the mask is to protect others, right? To be able to transmit the love and not the, the danger of the presence. Um, yeah, which is indeed poignant and relevant um, in this a uh, strange moment of um, seeing each other's faces, right? Only in this uh, pixelated way, but then otherwise masked and not being able to behold the, um, our full faces. And yet um, that that's for the sake of, of life and healing and protection. Um, Does anyone else have uh, something you'd like to share before I wrap us up? I was thinking maybe um, in addition to, hi, this is Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Um, in addition to, you know, wanting to protect others, I think about the mask as potentially protecting himself from 
for lack of a better word, I guess, maybe like sullying the divinity, the, mm. like, the purity of what he has to be able to keep it, um, you know, untouched and able to continue to spread the, the basis of what he knows. Mm -hmm. Sort of protecting that essence and that divine life such that he can transmit it. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful. Um, so uh, I want to thank you all for, for jumping into these texts, going on this journey um, with me. I um, wanted to share some words of a poem about the power of faces, which also to me captures the, the yearning that um, I know many of us are feeling in these times of being with each other um, face to face and also remembering um, that, again, this light that is transmitted to Moshe um, is something that is then shared from Moshe out um, to the entire people. And all of us are there too. All of us uh, were at Sinai. We are back there at Mount Sinai receiving this light um, of Moshe's yearning of all of the struggle and the wrestling of our ancestors and praying that um, this light will bring comfort and, and healing to us and that we can share it with, with others. Um, so this is a, a poem by June Jordan. I'm going to share an excerpt of it. It's called Poem for a Young Poet. Most people search all of their lives for some place to belong to, as you said. But I look instead into the eyes of anyone who talks to me. I search for a face to believe and belong to, a loosening mask with a voice, ears, and a consciousness breathing through a nose I can see. Day to day, it's the only way I like to travel noticing the colors of a cheek, the curvature of brow, and the public declarations of two lips. Okay, I did not say male or female. I did not say Serbian or Tutsi. I said what tilts my head into the opposite of fear or dread is anyone who talks to me. I search a face, a loosening mask with voice, ears, and a consciousness breathing through a nose that I can see. I search a face for obstacles to genocide. I search beyond the dead and driven by imperfect visions of the living. Yes and no, I come and go back to the eyes of anyone who talks to me. I'm so praying in these times we will share the light through our eyes, see the light of, of Torah, um, the light of, of compassion in each other's eyes and that that will um, bring healing and just close us out in the song that we started with and the end of this verse from Elazar Zikri, right? We say, please, my beloved, reveal yourself, spread the shelter of your peace over me. Ta'ir eretz mikvodecha nagila venismecha bach. May the whole world be illuminated with your glory then shall we be glad and rejoice with you. So sharing this as well as a kavanah for our Chag of Shavuot, may our Torah study bring light, bring illumination, and bring joy to all of us.
סוכת שלום אחד. יגאלה, גאלה, גאלה, נא. ופרוס, ופרוס חביבי עליי. את סוכת, סוכת שלום. חג שמח. Thank you so much. Thank you for your beautiful words, for the beautiful singing, for the, the poetry, the, the poetry that you shared at the end, but also the poetry of how you teach. Um, it's, been, it's just been wonderful to sit with you for this time. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. <laughs>